We once again thank God for His grace, for this opportunity to dive into His Word tonight. There's many things we could be doing tonight besides this. You. But we made a free will decision to come with an anticipation to hear his word. We're going to continue on with our teaching of Genesis, but the issue with Genesis 15, there's about two or three lines in Genesis 15 that are absolutely critical to your understanding of salvation and to his plan. The Bible does not contradict itself. It does not. So when you think it does, it requires you to ask questions. And the first two passages that we're going to open up tonight contradict themselves. Purposely. Why? To stretch you. To advance you to the next level, Keith. That's its whole purpose. Not to make you question the Bible. Not to make you question God. Not to make you question God's plan. Because all of it always starts with God. His word. His plan. You're his vessel. Let's go to Philippians 2. That would be New Testament. starting in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Have you seen that passage before, to work out your salvation? Matter of fact, I'm sure there have been pastors telling you, you better work out your salvation. Hold that spot and flip over to Ephesians, which is to your left. Chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8. Mm -hmm. so one book over to the left. Well, you were there in Philippians, but wherever... Yeah, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Now wait a second. The first one, if you flip over, says to work out your salvation. And this one says it's not by works. The so pastor, what is, it? So what, is it? what is it? Excellent question. Is God a liar? No. no. There has to be a reason. And for centuries, how long is one century? 100 years. For more than 100 years. Thousands at least, people have struggled with the topic justification. Now Genesis 15 touches on this, and that's why it's our topic. Because many people have been told, well, you've got to work out your salvation. But they say, but wait a second, but it's not by works, it's by faith alone. I'm confused. It has everything to do with justification that answers this question. What is Justification. Just as if you never sinned. Any idea? 
What do you think justification is? Just a, you could even say it's a it, it, it's a, a device you use in your kitchen. Well, Whatever you think. What do you think justification is? It's your faith, I would say. Okay. What do you think justification is? Just as if you never sinned. Just as if you never sinned. Okay. That comes from the Book of Tradition, chapter one, verses one. <laughs> but it's all right. <laughs> it's okay because that's what you know, right? Why did you come here? Did you come here to learn something, or did you come here just to be reminded of what you already knew? No. <laughs> now the fact is, justification has everything to do with sin, but nothing to do with sin, and I'll explain. Justification means to declare one righteous. To declare one righteous. You were not righteous before, but now you're justified and you're righteous. Yeah, that's what I was meaning. This term justification, the Greek word. It's kind of a hard one. I'll have to spell it first. D-I-K-A-I-O-O. D-I-K-A-I-O. It means where a guilty person, after serving his sentence, he comes back to court and is told, you are justified. Why? Because you completed your sentence. Back in the old days, when you would serve your prison sentence, you would come back to court and they would stamp justified. Because you, you did your time. The Bible uses it similarly, but differently. The Bible uses it similarly, but differently, in which in our case, it's something we can't pay. You understand? If you're a criminal, you do your time, it's paid. According to the Bible, we can't pay it. against you is the key. We've been, we've been in Genesis, right? We know that sin started before we were ever here. So right off the bat, we're guilty. Imagine for a moment you're seated in a courtroom. You're on trial for murder. Just imagine that. A crime that carries the punishment of death penalty. The evidence against you has been delivered to the jury and your attorney has presented your defense. Now you await the jury's verdict. A hush falls over the courtroom as the jury foreman steps forward. You rise to your feet and you face the judge, but you know one fact that no one else in the courtroom knows for sure, and that is you committed the crime, that you're guilty. As the jury foreman announces the verdict of guilty, you're not surprised. The judge pounds the gavel and pronounces your sentence. You cannot escape the penalty and your lawyer cannot protect you. You're helpless to save yourself. But as you're led away from the courtroom in handcuffs, a man steps forward. This man is a stranger to you. I will take your punishment, he says. I will be your substitute. The judge leans forward to question him. At last, satisfied by the man's qualifications, he accepts the stranger as your substitute. The handcuffs are removed from your wrists and put on his. While this man undeservably goes to death in your place, you're set free. 
You're allowed to live even though you're guilty because someone else has taken your punishment. People today are not sure if they're saved because they don't think if they, they work hard enough. In ancient times, when you committed a crime and you paid your sentence, they would put a stamp not justified, it would mean in the language tetelestai. You know what tetelestai means? Yeah. It is finished. Oh, yeah. What did Christ say on the cross? It is finished. Tetelestai. That's important because in Genesis 15, you get to see the picture of salvation, but we're not going there yet. Let's go to Hebrews 7. This is very, very important. Hebrews 7. Yep. People are working, 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 trying to please God. Today on Facebook, or on the news, the mayor of New York said he's going to earn his way to heaven because he's paying a huge debt. Oh. Yeah. That speaks volumes to all the workers out there. Well, I better work harder so I can go. Hebrews 7, verse 27 says, no, 26, for it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up, offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Underline once for all. You say 26, 7, 26? Uh-huh, 26 and 27. Oh, 26, 25, I've got 25 here. Are you in, where are you at? I'm in Rome. Well, we're in Hebrews. <laughs> at least that would be there. At least I'm not crazy. <laughs> Once and for all. It's okay, Keith. Now we're going to Colossians. <laughs> What's another condiment besides mustard? <laughs> Ketchup. <laughs> Catch up, Chief. Colossians 2, 14. Colossians 2, verse 14. It's the only joke I make to you tonight. I'm not in a joking mood. Can you tell? Yeah. First Colossians? Or second Colossians? Neither. Colossians? I'm in Colossians. I think you're in Corinthians. Colossians is C-O-L. Corinthians and C-O-R. It's all right, brother. At least you're not mayonnaise. <laughs> He's going to make me hungry. <laughs> mayonnaise, mustard, ketchup. <laughs> Where's the bird? <laughs> you got Colossians? C-H-O. Nope, that's Chronicles. Co. C-O. Look, check it out right here. Is it in the Old Testament? New. It's all right, though. I'm waiting for Jesus. John. I don't have to John, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll get there eventually. Nice. Right. Catch up, Chief. <laughs> yeah, you know. I got a song for you there later. Acts from I don't know what that is. Go ahead. No. Oh. Are you going to make him go? Did you find it? That's Corinthians. 
certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross grace grace yeah not by works grace go to John I know what that's at Jesus. chapter 1 he's <laughs> a John 1, 17. John 1, 17. It sounds like this. I guess I wish we did have blinds. But then again, I'm glad I'm not blind. They might be getting ready to come in. That's God's business. Exactly. Maybe they're, they're John 1, mind. 17. They wanted to come visit churches. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now, no one can declare themselves righteous in God's eyes unless God declares them righteous. Right. Once again, <laughs> no one can declare themselves righteous in God's eyes unless God declares them righteous. It's God that sets the standard, not man. How does God view our righteousness before we're declared righteous? How does God view our righteousness? Can anybody tell me? How does God view our righteousness before we're declared righteous? How does he view it? Any idea? I don't know. Look at Isaiah 64, Old Testament. Isaiah 64, I-S-A-I-H. I-S-A-I-H. I S. A-I-H. Isaiah 64. Look at the second part of verse 6. And all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. You've heard me talk about this before, haven't you? What does the Hebrew say? Do you remember? Pam? Our righteousness is like what? Do you remember? Menstrual rags. Oh, yeah. So God sees God sees our righteousness yes. 
Sure you will. Dirty, clean, whatever. That's what I think about this. What is it, the electric bill? <clears throat> it's not my kind of bill. When we are saved, we are clothed in His righteousness. So we go from our own righteousness to His righteousness. We're clothed in His righteousness. Sweet. Stay where you're at. We'll move over a couple pages to Isaiah 61. Verse 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. Do you? I try. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. I go to Philippians. Going back there again. I am building a case. As you're writing down these passages, you're going to begin to connect them. There's a connection in all of them. Philippians chapter 3. New Testament. Philippians. That's Exodus, you're in Old Testament. New Testament, this is the right. No, you got to have one to begin with. So because you have one, you can't lose it. Philippians. Philippians, starting at 290. Flip, keep flipping. <clears throat> Philippians 3, verse 9. No, verse 8. <laughs> More than that, I count all things to be loss. Really? <laughs> In view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. The only way we can receive his righteousness is through faith. That's it. If God sets the standard, if I if 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 the Bible said, and it doesn't. If the Bible says in order to receive salvation, you have to put up one finger. And you say, okay, God, here's five. I love you. I appreciate you. You don't make it. Right. He said one. Right. Not five. But because you have a stinky righteousness, you want to try and top God... And say, well, I'm going to give you five. When he said one is the only requirement. What is the only requirement for salvation? What did that just say? Five letter word starts with F, ends in H. Faith. Faith. That's it. Read, read ten, will you? Sure. <laughs> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. There we go. Oh, that just spoils it.
be conformed to his death in order that I may attain to resurrection from the dead. That's as far as I'm going because that goes into a whole other thing. That's all I want. Let's go over to James. Starts with a J A New Testament. Go to your sheet. Watch this. J A right side. J A M E S. The Epistle of James. Hebrews James. That's New Testament word. That's old. This is new. James. James. James two. I better go to it. I didn't write this. Verse 10. 210? Yes. See, before Christ, they followed the law. The Pharisees were so righteous, they gave God 10 when they didn't have to. James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point... He's become guilty of all. Guilty. Of all. Now watch this. Go back to Romans, to your left. Romans, New Testament. Romans 6.23. Romans 8, I'm sorry, 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. If I said, Keith, come to my house, I'm going to give you $100. And you drive there, and before I give you the 100 I say, do me a favor, would you go cut my lawn? That is not a free gift. So how can you work for your salvation? Exactly. Do you remember when I taught sanctification? Yeah. yeah. Remember how I separated salvation and sanctification? After you're saved, do you not then begin to do work? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're here. We're still working. Do you see? But faith in Christ requires zero work. When we get to Genesis 15, you'll see why I'm teaching this. So be patient with me. What did you do? What did you personally do for God to put Jesus on the cross? What did you do? Born a no, what did you do to put Jesus up on the cross? Nothing. Nothing. You had no part of it. No. So how can you have a part of taking him off of it? Can't. You can't. So how if you if you didn't he did it take, on his own. He did it all. Tetelestai, it is finished. Right. Right. His work is finished. Huh. His work is finished. But our work has just begun. We need to be conformed to his image. That takes work. That takes an attitude of gratitude. First. Second, it takes obedience. But that's not what I'm teaching. Go to Psalm 103. Psalm is Old Testament. P-S-A-L-M. Old Testament. Left side of the page. Psalm 107. Psalm 103. Now, most, some of this stuff I've covered before, but never under the topic of justification. And I told you we would cover justification. A while ago I mentioned it. Now we're here. Because there's everything to do with Genesis 15, and you'll see when I get there. 103.12. As far as from the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What's the possibility of east and west combining? Um. Impossible. So your sins are covered. Remember we read once and for all? Right. 
Does that mean you can do whatever you want? No. No. Why not? Because he paid it. The sin separates us. However, go to Romans 4. Back to Romans again. We're all over the place today. Romans 4, verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Do you know that when you stand before him, are you aware that your sin is not going to be the issue? When you stand before him, are you aware that he's not going to say, you know, I really didn't like how dirty your car was. He's not going to care. He's going to look at what did you do with what I gave you. That's one of the things he's going to look at. And part of that has everything to do with where we're going back to Hebrews again. At verse 12, chapter 12, verse 6. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So if you think that you can get away with your sin just because of grace, you can't. He's going to discipline you. That's when you're wrong. Does it mean he's not going to test you? Oh, no, he will. No, he'll test you every day. He will. He's testing us right now as a church. See, I'm afraid you. Now let's go to Isaiah. I-S-A-I-H. Old Testament. Isaiah 38. Turn right to it. Starting in verse 17. Lo, for my own welfare, I had great bitterness. It is thou who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. He doesn't see them. They're paid for. Isaiah 38, 17. Now we're going to swing over to Galatians. That's New Testament. G-A-L. Galatians. Chapter 2. Verse 16. Galatians, New Testament. Here's new. Here's old. Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 2.16. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now we're going back to Romans, to your left. 
I can't wait to teach on this. Oh my goodness, I love Romans. <laughs> Romans 9. Other left. Other way going. Yeah, no, you're going to the right. That's to the left. There you go. Romans 9. Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it though, but as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. They thought it was by works. When their teachings told them it was by faith. Hear me clearly. They were taught by faith alone. But they decided it would be by works. That's why they missed it. We're in Genesis, right? So that's why this is important. But before we get there, slide over to Romans 3. We're almost going to it, I promise. Is it Romans 3? Yep, verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, turn to Genesis 15. They knew better. They had the law, they had the words, but they never applied it. Oops. Genesis 15. We're going to read through it, and then I'm going to go back. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I love when he says that, do not fear. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will thou give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned in him as righteousness. What did he do? He believed in the Lord. Faith. And it was counted to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to possess it. And he said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror of great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Now for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years, but I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, 
and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the, of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day of the Lord, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, and the Kenizzite, and the Catamanite, and the Hittite, and the Parasite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Gigashite, and the Jebusite. Now next Wednesday, we're going to go through this whole book, this whole chapter. But I wanted to go through to point out the most important verse, which was 6. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned to him as righteousness. Do you remember the story of Passover? I don't know if the door had windows, but for our purpose, you have a door that looks like that, right? Yeah. Has the cross in the middle of it, right? You know those doors? Yeah. Okay. Imagine in the window you have a family. A husband, a wife, <laughs> and two children. And they hear that death is going to come upon them. But in order for them to be saved, there's something they must do. And that is to give a sacrifice and put blood over the door. Now, the angel of the Lord said, I'm going to come and death is going to come upon him. But if you have the blood over the door, you'll be all right. Now I want you to imagine the family that's inside the house knowing what's going on on the outside. You know those two kids are probably fighting. Complaining over something. There's some kind of a fight going on. Yeah. Because not all households are without fighting. Every household fights. So imagine they're getting in an argument when the angel of death comes over. Does God care about the argument? No. No, because the only way they're saved is how? Did they, did they set that rule? No, God did. He said, I will put it over the door. As long as you have it, you'll be saved. Go to John 8. No, 56. Your father Abraham, Abram, same one, rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. When did he see it? What is Jesus referring to? Day he he died. Oh, the day he believed. The Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
before Abraham was born, what does it say? I am. I am. We all agree that's what it says, I am? Let's go to Exodus 3. Now Jesus said that, right? Starting at verse 13. 3.13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to him? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am. I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. What did Jesus say? I, I am. That would be the same name, wouldn't it be? That would be the same person, wouldn't it? As we go through Genesis, we will continue to see how men will try and work for their salvation. And they'll also work for their sanctification. Because we do, don't we? We, hurt, we work every day, right? But without him, can't do anything. And because we're in Genesis and we see these names, you will find as we cover these names, every one of them suffered. Even the richest of the rich suffered. And Abram wanted a perfect life. He even said to God, well, all is well, but I don't have any children. He said, you're going to have more children than you can even count. And he says, well, how do I know that? <laughs> what we're going to cover down the road, I'm going to give you a is we're going to see the same Abraham finally getting the child and God says now I want you to kill him. But God why would you bring me this far Pretend that state. Okay? Stay.
he's God and we're not. He did the work. He brought us here. All of this means absolutely nothing to me. I'm sorry. It's materialistic stuff that when I die won't be buried with me. Like this? And I can question God all night long. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? I could. He gives us free will to do that. And nobody blames you for questioning God. Abraham did it. David did it. Isaac did it. Jacob did it. Moses did it. Paul did it. Saul did it. John did it. They all questioned God, yet they believed. Again. But did they get punished? In their own ways. Because for those he loves, he disciplines. The fact is, what matters most is what we do with what we have. As of right now, we don't have rent or the bills. Did it stop me from teaching? No. No. Will it stop me from teaching? No. Have you done the best that you can with all that you have? Yeah. I know you have. And I know you'll continue to do. Right? Right. Why? I love the Lord. Huh? And the Lord did everything to me. So all matters to me. If you have that, I think It's easy to question why would God, when I had a great paying job and everybody was getting paid, everybody was happy. Absolutely. For two hours, I dealt with it. And I continued to deal with it for over two and a half years. Did I complain to him? Absolutely. Almost every day. And he opened up a door. Oh, yeah. And if I love him, I would follow him. But could I let go of what I know? Could I let go of what I'm comfortable with? Yeah. You know why? Because the only thing that matters is what he did for me. If that's not good enough and I need more, then I've got to check my motivation and what I'm doing. I have to. Our spiritual life is not centered around our filthy rags. What he cares about is what did we do with what he gave us. I want to know why we don't have that money. It's because we're not all working hard to do the best we can? Absolutely! Do you think he knows that? Yeah. You think it's a coincidence? What? Will our, is, is, does Steve see us now as delinquents because he doesn't have our money? Have you gotten a letter? I haven't. Well, but we look bad. 
I can do nothing and look bad. I don't care how I look. I wish all those people were still here. brought them, not us. He's the one who took them away. If everybody drove by and saw those down, aha! They finally closed! They're gone! Yay! So what? Who cares? Does it hurt your pride? That's the question he asked me. I said, yeah. I said, get over it. It ain't about you. You are my vessel. If this was not here, so what? We have not received an eviction notice. I'm not leaving. I will contact him and let him know. <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't have rent. And we don't have the utilities. I guess we have two choices. We stay. And by grace you keep people in here. Or we go. Which would you prefer? And whatever he says is up to him. How's your faith now? It's stronger. How's your faith? It's stronger than Do you know I believe you? I do. Do you know that? I believe you. Do you do anything for you? It's a test. I know. What are we holding on to? Are we really interested in his word? I know the answer to that because you're here. Don't get me wrong. Those are down for a reason. He's going to do one of two things. <coughs> Replace them with new people. They're gone. I'm not looking behind. I'm looking forward. But as the pastor of this church, I have a choice. Do I quit you? That's the question. You know the answer already. You know me. I won't quit. I can't quit. I don't care 
if I worship out of the Cadillac? <laughs> if you have a challenge with worshiping out of a Cadillac, then by golly, you have every right to go to any church you want. But if that is where we're worshiping from, that's where we worship from. And it's up to you. I can't force you. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to play games with God. He knows how to fill that. With a clear conscience, can we say we have done the best that we can with what we have? Yeah. Is there some hidden sin that everyone's hiding? No. So what do we do? Cause cow. What a cause. <laughs> or quit. That's our choice. Trust God. I wish. All we need is two or three rich people, and we got it made. There's tons of them in Sparta. The owner of this building has got more money than he knows what to do with. I could probably focus on all that we don't have. That's not good. Why? That be no good. Why? Because I want more. I want more. Brother, I know I like. Well, that's the truth. He always gives it, don't he? Do you true. know? Do you know? I want to ordain you so bad, but I'm afraid the moment I ordain you, you're going to leave. No, I will not leave. <laughs> Everything that I've done <laughs> as leader of this church has been with all my heart. There is not nothing that I haven't done that I can look back and say, well, I didn't do this good enough. Because I know I've done everything in my power, in my power. The rest is up to him. I study, I teach, and I love. That's good enough for me. I don't pet heads because you're not a dog. You're a brother and you're a sister in Christ. That's the way I'll treat you. You deserve that respect. You're a child of God, not a sheep. Even though sometimes you can be bad. <laughs> I can be just as bad. Trust me. This was not to discourage. Right. This was to encourage. Do you think I'm going to promise you that I'm not going to quit and then quit? Oh, come on, just a little bit. Why not? Because I know you. <laughs> Do you know me? I think so. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. You know me. We've napped together. You know that most of the people that left, except for a small handful, still come to me with questions? Uh -huh. I'm sure. I can imagine that. And they wonder why? Or what? I don't know. Sure. No, they, they just, they, they take what they want and then they go. They take what they want. Mm -hmm. Half the time I feel like I'm being 
used? Um, manhandled. Nice way to put it. They take what they want and then they go. Seems to way that's the way everyone is treated. I'm waiting for the glorious life to appear. But the things that matter most. That's what counts. And Abraham, Abram, he's not Abraham yet. Yeah, just like the Eve of the woman thing. We're going to be right. doing this for the next couple chapters. Right. But Abram believed the Lord enough. How much is required of faith? Once your seed. But in three passages after, what does he say? Well, how do I know you're really going to do that? I thought he just believed. Wait, what happened? He hasn't worked out his salvation yet. Not yet. He will. When his test when he says, kill Isaac, when he says, close Sparta Bible Church, I will close that door. And if before I put that key in to finally lock it, he says, stop, fine. But if he doesn't, click, that door will be locked. I'm not going to change my faith at all. I do not look at anything that's happened in the past as a failure. I don't. Because I can see the pieces that he ordained. I didn't call the rock. They called me. I didn't ask GEM to put an ultimatum on my head. But they did. I had a decision to make, and I made the decision. And by making that decision, cost me a lot, financially and in relationships. And then I get to the rock, and what happens? And then we move to a house. And then what happens there? I didn't call Anne and tell Anne to call her son and say, bring us there. I had another choice to make. Do I trust God? Yeah. So I took it. And then that fell apart. And now we've got to go to a blue building. And we had to trust God. We get to the blue building and all of a sudden they say, Mom, we don't have enough room. We need a new building. We need a new building. We need a new building. I was happy right where we were. But another opportunity came. And I had a choice to make. And I made it. But I didn't make it alone. Y'all made it with me. But for every transaction, we had to talk about it. She said, follow the Lord. I did. And so here we are. I'm glad we had a yard sale. He says, how did you treat my sister? He's 
same answer <laughs> with patience. With a double portion of patience. <laughs> See, I can say that jokingly, but the problem is, here's what I learned three days later. We're going to have a conversation. Did you mean that? No. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> Did you mean that? <laughs> See, I don't need patience for her. I just have to love her. That takes patience. I'm not perfect. <sighs> Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lesson on faith and righteousness. Father, your word tells us that you know the plans you have for us. Plans to prosper. Plans to hope. Plans for a future. Father, we are in love with you, not with the ministry. Not with this building. not even with our own spiritual lives. But we love you because while we were yet sinners, you died for us, that we would have eternal life. And we recognize that in this time, we're being tested like never before. And the question is, is what do we do with that test? And you, Father, you have all the facts. We don't. And we thank you that we can have worship here. You know our hearts. You know everything about us. And now, Father, there are those who are also being tested. Who will drive by and who will see the pictures down. Because that's where the light is. That's the only light left on that shelf. And they will be gone. And that will be their test, Lord. We will only do what you tell us to do. And I recognize that in these tests, we have two choices. trust or we don't. But either way, we know you'll love us. And we know that we are justified by our faith. We thank you so much for tonight's service. We thank you for your word. We thank you for those who could join us tonight. For those, Father, that couldn't be here tonight, I just pray that you continue to bless them, that you continue to guide them, that you continue to shield them from the influences of evil. And Father, I pray that your message tonight will cause us to draw closer to you and away from tradition, away from religion, that we would rely solely on you, keeping our eyes on you and not of this world. I thank you so much and I love you. I look forward to the plan that you have for Sunday. It is not a coincidence that Sunday is the day that represents when you rose again. And Father, I don't even have the message yet for Sunday. But I know that the topic that you pick for Sunday's teaching will have everything to do with why we celebrate what we celebrate, why we do what we do, and why we believe what we believe. Not because of what he or she says, but because of what
because what you say is final. And we thank you so much. We love you. And we ask these things in